Okay, okay. We'll build the wall. We need to build a wall. A big, beautiful wall. Build a wall. It was one of his main campaign pledges to build a wall all along the U.S.-Mexico border. A third of it already has some sort of barrier. But what are the challenges of trying to seal it off completely? I'll be traveling the entire length of the U.S.-Mexico border to find the stories of the people who call the borderlands home, to see how the fence that's already in place has affected their lives, and to try to find out what impact the wall President Trump wants to build could have. And the journey starts here, at the very beginning of the border, where the Gulf of Mexico meets the Rio Grande. Reynosa is the kind of place that to the Americans justifies a wall. It is the most dangerous city on the border, a battlefield to control a key route for migrants and drug traffickers. We are on a patrol with the special forces that guard this place. Long gun battles between government forces and drug cartels are common in this city, with people often caught in the middle. It's a place where local journalists have been attacked and threatened for reporting on the drug cartels. The presence of international media is rare here, and that's why we have to take these security measures. It has been a quiet shift, but it is not long before they are called into action. So the officers just spotted two cars. One, one of them seems to be abandoned, and they just got off the pickups to check what's going on. The police believe something suspicious is going on. Here, different factions of the Gulf and Los Zetas cartels are at the heart of a long and violent feud to dominate a profitable business. According to the US government, drug trafficking is a $64 billion industry in the country. The police can't find anything, so the suspects are not arrested. Then, proof of how difficult it is to deal with the cartels. Colonel Solis is listening into cartel members. Hablan nuevamente de la mixta en en calles que tienen un código para ellos que nosotros desconocemos cuál es. Este que está hablando es un eh, mando de los halcones que lo está eh, supervisando a ellos. Están, están insultando por hubo alguna falla. Están insultando a, a, a algún halcón porque se descuidó en algún mensaje que envió. These hawks are a constant menace. Durante todo el trayecto ellos nos van siguiendo, van informando la ruta que seguimos para permitir que el gente que está haciendo alguna actividad ilícita logre escapar antes de la llegada de nosotros. Cuando ya estamos próximos al punto, inclusive nos llegan a tirar ponchallantas para hacer más lento nuestro, nuestro avance o bien para impedir que sigamos avanzando. The migrants who arrive from the south and those deported from the north, they are also targets for the cartels. This refuge offers them a respite in the middle of uncertain times. These men have just been sent back from the US, where there are an estimated 11 million unauthorized immigrants. This year, on average, the US authorities have apprehended nearly 600 people a day trying to cross the border. Sister Maria Nidelvia has seen more deportees in the last few months. Llegan, se registran, salen al puente y son presa fácil de la violencia. Son del puente, a veces son recogidos, ¿verdad? Lo, para secuestro, para robo. O sea que es una persona que llega, eh, sobre todo los que llevan mucho tiempo en Estados Unidos, no se imagina el riesgo, el problema que está en la frontera ahorita. Jorge Torres was deported twice in the last three weeks. He experienced this threat firsthand. 
que si eres mojado, quieres volver a cruzar, qué estabas haciendo, dónde te agarraron y te cobro tanto y te piden una clave, tienes que dar la clave, si no das clave, te reportan, luego, luego te levantan, te secuestran, te sacan dinero, sí, te pueden quitar la vida en cuestión de, de tiempo, sí, ese es el riesgo, es muy, muy peligroso Reynosa. We are on our way to interview a high-ranking official to find out how the government is coping with this new influx of deportees to Reynosa. We also want to ask him what they are doing to prevent these people from becoming an easy prey for the powerful cartels that terrorize the city. This is the most dangerous state along the whole border and we need an armed escort to travel to the capital where the government has its offices. Tamaulipas has the nation's highest number of disappearances, close to 6,000 people. It is a disturbing figure that could be much higher since only a fraction of all cases are reported. Juan Pollier, mucho gusto. Victor ¿Cómo Sainz, estás? bienvenido. Muy bien, Juan. Gracias. The government is in a tough position. The local police was so corrupt, it was dismantled years ago. El reto sí es mayúsculo. Lo estamos afrontando como tal. Estamos fortaleciendo nuestros cuerpos de seguridad. Actualmente tenemos un déficit enorme en el tema de, de la fuerza del Estado porque tenemos alrededor de 2.700 policías para un Estado tan vasto en el que debiéramos de tener un mínimo de 9.000. The cartels take advantage of this. Eh, los grupos de la delincuencia organizada están ávidos de recurso humano y obviamente también de recurso material, entiéndase dinero, por lo tanto, cada que llega un, un, una eh, tanda de, de repatriados a cualquiera de nuestras fronteras, ellos están atentos para buscar extorsionarlos, para buscar secuestrarlos o para buscar incluso eh, sumarlos a sus líneas eh, de, de ataque. From up here, it's striking to see how close Mexico is to the U.S. That river called Rio Bravo by the Mexicans and Rio Grande by the Americans is the flowing border dividing and uniting both countries for hundreds of kilometers. In most of Texas is the place where the next phase of the wall will be built. For many, that's a threat to the properties and to the landscape itself. Building the wall will be difficult and money may not be the biggest hurdle. Getting the land is a major issue because over 90% of the border in Texas is privately owned. Under the Bush administration, many landowners received letters saying they would have to sell their land to the government. Noel Benavides first received a letter in 2008. For nine years, nothing happened, but he recently got another one. He's realistic about the situation. So why, why do you think there is no point in fighting the government on this? On uh, fighting the sale? Yeah. Because uh, Homeland Security has all the uh, uh, power in the world right now. They, uh, they can do and uh, not do whatever they want to. The land has been in his wife's family for more than 250 years, since it was granted by the King of Spain, before it was Mexican territory, long before it became the US. So where are we exactly? Right now, like I said, we're on the second uh, bank of the property. This is the flat plain. And this is all gonna be, supposedly this is where the wall's going to be. So your land will be on the other side of the wall? Yes, part of the property will be on the other side. And it, it'll probably be approximately 20 acres or maybe a little more. And you will be able to access your, your property? How will that work? Uh, they tell me that there's going to be uh, openings where we can access the, uh, the property. But I, I, mean, how. I mean, like, it won't be a continuous wall or you have like a key? <laughs> well, it's, that's a good question. More than likely, it'll be just an opening, which would defeat the purpose of the wall. But that's, uh, that's the government for you. Let's go see what the river looks like. 
Ultimately, Congress has to approve President Trump's budget before construction can begin. If and when it comes, Noel doesn't believe the wall will do the job. And do you think the wall will serve its purposes? Well, the wall's supposed to uh, keep people out, and I don't think it's going to do that. In uh, the history of mankind, I don't think a wall has kept anything or anybody out. I think a virtual wall would be more effective than any uh, wall made out of uh, mortar and brick and what have you. This virtual wall that Noel is talking about already exists, and my next meeting is with the people who defend it. This is a training exercise. Border patrol agents practice how to deal with drowning migrants. The Rio Grande Valley is popular with people trying to enter the country. 45% of all the apprehensions on the border take place in this sector. But patrols of the river are just one part of the strategy. We have sensors, we have cameras, we have uh, agents on patrol, we have different types of infrastructure, bridges, uh, roads that give us easier access to, like I said, those points that are breached on the border. Uh, we have different types of vehicles. We have uh, four-wheelers, horses, uh, bicycles, and dirt bikes. So we have a multi-layered defense approach to border security. Agent Castro believes fencing deters some, but the key is more people on the ground, something President Trump has promised to deliver. The main needs, of course, are personnel, technology, and infrastructure. Uh, the technology, so we can have situ situational awareness of what's coming in, uh, the infrastructure to get to that detection or that breach um, in the border. And of course you need the personnel, you can have all the technology and infrastructure, but if you don't have the personnel to respond efficiently and effectively, then it becomes useless. I'm making a short detour from the border itself. We are on the outskirts of Alfurrias, where a border patrol checkpoint has created a second frontier. Don White is a volunteer and he's looking for migrants. More often than not, he only finds the remains. So you look for the, the paths that they travel and then you backtrack those to see if anybody's been left behind. This toothpaste was probably left behind by migrants hiding in these ranch lands and many of them die here. And what's striking is that we are more than 100 kilometers north of the actual border with Mexico, and you can hear the cars passing along the highway. This is a major corridor used by people smugglers and drug traffickers. The migrants who made it across the Rio Grande must still avoid detection as they head to the final destinations. To circumvent the checkpoint, migrants are forced to walk through the surrounding brush for up to 40 kilometers. This is not the place where migrants expect to die, but they do. It's also dangerous for Don. I'm not worried about encountering the border crossers. I'm worried about the drug smugglers. That's why I carry what I carry, because that's, that's for the drug smugglers. They're, they're carrying armed. I want to make sure I can equal up. Don works with the Missing Migrant Initiative, a multi-agency project led by the Border Patrol. Their aim? To recover those left behind. It's easy to get lost, and many migrants die of heat and exhaustion, more than 550 in the last seven years. The leaves were under this one, so that was dropped uh, three, four months ago. Half an hour into our patrol, Don finds something. It's also bug eating. A rancher found a skull one time. He called it in, it was collected. And the sheriff asked if I could do a follow-up search of the area with some anthropologists. We went out there, um, tore up some rat mounds. And these, these are big rats. Tore up the rat mounds, a huge cactus, but we uh, found several more bones a cell phone, a photo ID, 
So, you know, that was, that was an excellent follow-up search. It was really good. Why does Don, who lives three hours away, often spend days here? Decades ago, his niece was kidnapped and killed, and it took two months for her remains to be found. If you've lost somebody in your family and you don't know where they were, they were lost, you don't know where they're at, you don't know if they're even buried, um, you have nothing that you can, nothing you can bury, nothing you can go worship to, nothing you can go visit, nothing you can put flowers on. That's, uh, that's a pretty harsh way to die. It's hard on the families, really hard on the families. So. I guess that's why I do it, just uh, for the families that are still alive. My next stop is in Laredo, where almost 60% of the trade between Mexico and the U.S. passes. Jose Antonio Garcia is a trucker who takes cargo across every week. Today, he's starting out on a trip to Tennessee that is going to take him 27 hours. Jose's job comes with risks. This is also a lucrative smuggling point. Jose Antonio just told me that many of his colleagues have been forced by the cartels to carry drugs into the U.S. and there's nothing they can do about it. The only way they have to do is to get scared to de tu familia o tuya, no sabes que te vamos a matar, vamos a secuestrar a tu familia, entonces tú lo que no quieres es que le pase a tu familia nada. El negocio de, la, de, la, de lo, lo ilegal es una cosa que tiene que pasar a fuerzas. O sea, pasa porque pasa. ¿Por qué? Porque es una necesidad. La droga se consume en Estados Unidos. Vamos, México. México que regresa a México, en México regresan las armas y el dinero. Tiene que pasar. ¿Y dónde pasa, amigo? 850 trucks cross this bridge every hour, making it the busiest commercial crossing on the border and in the Western Hemisphere. Many of them are inspected over there. Many of them are not. So goods and drugs flow into the US. Goods and guns come into Mexico. Would a wall be able to stop all the illegal trafficking? So far, we've been through a lot of built-up areas, but our next destination is a bit more remote. I'm at the Big Bend National Park, a place with mountains, with canyons, where the desert meets the Rio Grande. It's a stunning, dramatic, and desolate landscape. Let's take a look. An Indian legend says that after the creation, all the remaining rocks were left in the Big Bend, walls from another era, hundreds of meters high, in a place where the border bends and from which the park takes its name. The river turns frequently and it's not always easy to see which side is Mexico or the US. At this tiny border crossing point, I've arranged to meet park ranger Jeanette Jurado. She tells me the park has the border's fewest illegal crossings. Routinely, the Border Patrol tells us that here in Big Bend National Park, we have the lowest statistics for any section of the U.S.-Mexican border. And within the park, we protect 12% of the U.S.-Mexican border, so it's a significant piece. In this vast, remote and lonely place, the binational cooperation is essential, and borders are hard to distinguish. Just on the other side of our river, well, we only have one half of the river to begin with. That other half is preserved by Mexican national parks. So we have canyons here, but we can only preserve one half of the canyon, one half of the river. And then to have a partnership with Mexico to make sure this landscape is preserved as part of a larger ecosystem, that our vistas don't end right at that political boundary, right in the middle of the Rio Grande, is a truly beautiful thing that we have down here. Many people who come here don't even realize that the other half of our canyon is Mexico, for example. The river is sometimes so shallow, you don't even need a boat. Mike Davidson has been visiting this area for over 40 years. As a river guide, he knows this place intimately and he's agreed to take me downstream. Here, 
Ah, sí, ya sí, 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 right there. Next here. Uh -oh. Da la vuelta. In terms of of the number of people coming to the area and a certain amount of development, there's been quite a few changes in that time. For me, when you still get into the national park and go on the river, you can go places where you feel like you're the only person that's ever been there. So that's what I really like about this area. As with other people that visit and work in this area, he's concerned about the future. You know, the whole experience of Big Ben with a big, uh, a big, tall, strong, beautiful wall, as they say, is, uh, w would severely degrade the visitor experience here. This is one of our national treasures. You know, we can't just throw it away. On the Mexican side is a small town called Boquillas del Carmen. Months after the 9-11 attacks, the port of entry was closed. It wasn't reopened until four years ago, and Boquillas suffered. You know, that was a big change. It really ruined this town. And this is, a, this is one of these one-size-fits-all solutions where they treated the whole border like a big danger zone and uh, really didn't deserve that. And so now, with all this talk about building, building a border wall and really cracking down, you know, we, we worry that the gains that we've made in international relations here we fear that that may be, uh, be left behind if they build this wall. I have now completed the first half of the trip. And so far, I have traveled along a border where the river is the natural barrier. But from now on, I'm going to be visiting places where fences have been in place for years. So we're going to be seeing much more of this. For several years now, a wall has divided the border towns of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And it's here I want to see how its residents have adapted. Every morning, Luis drives from the Mexican side of the border into the US. For many here, it is a way of life. We cannot show his face because his American company doesn't allow him to speak. I leave uh, at 2.30 uh, 2 in the morning. They take an hour to be across the border. I don't like to be waiting in the line. This is the kind of journey that many people in Ciudad Juarez make every day to go and work in El Paso. My job is uh, construction. I work for a company and they do concrete. Uh, and right now, when uh, we're doing the water, it's another job, you know. It's like uh, they send somebody to drive a bus, he's doing his job, you know, yeah. And for my job is just to make the wall this time. What, what have uh, your relatives or friends told you about building this, this fence? Um, they joke with me, and like they tell me to, just to leave a little open for them to cross. This is the construction site where he's currently working. The first barriers went up in 1994 at the western end of the border. Successive governments led by Clinton, Bush and Obama extended them all along the frontier. The fence here was erected 10 years ago and Luis is repairing a two kilometer stretch of it. He believes the American president is fooling himself if he thinks the frontier can be completely sealed off. Porque de, aunque esté el muro, de una u otra forma vamos a cruzar. Sí, me, eso no, el muro no nos va a impedir nada. Los mexicanos hacen el trabajo que los gabachos no quieren hacer. Como andar en el campo, andar en el tiro, en la construcción. No muchos americanos quieren andar haciendo eso. Y si nos sacan a todos, a ver qué chingados hacen. Es lo único que le puedo decir a Trump. Sí, me, Que no saque, pues a ver quién le va a ir a limpiar su yarda. <laughs> Standing so close to it, it's obviously a very imposing structure. There used to be a smaller fence here, but it's now being replaced with these five meter high metal poles. And the closer you get to the fence, the more you wonder how the wall President Trump wants to build will serve its purposes and how will it affect the lives and businesses of people in border towns. Since the fence was built, Ciudad Juarez became one of the most violent places in the world. 
In contrast, El Paso is now among the safest cities in the U.S. You know, they would just cross right here. This is Manis Rodriguez. The barrier runs through her backyard. Days ago, she saw migrants jumping it with a ladder. We were fixing our truck back here and uh, we heard the voices. And we looked outside, but we couldn't see no one. And, and we said, where are the voices coming from? Well, when we saw up, they had a ladder, you know, they built a big, <laughs> like that swimming pool ladder, and they just, you know, hooked it up to the fence, and they crossed over, then the other one pulled it to the other side, they crossed down, and then they just jumped. And I said, well, they just, you know, uh, they said, bye. <laughs> On the whole, though, she says things have improved. We have um, less people crossing. We have less uh, cargo, as we say, crossing over. Now, you know, we feel safe. A granddaughter of Mexicans, Rodriguez supports President Trump's plans. As security, yes. As security, yes, I do. I believe that, that he's trying to protect the U.S. The way I see it, I would go to Juarez, but I won't trust my daughter to go to Juarez, right? So that's how I feel. And yeah. I'm not saying that I'm against Mexicans or Juarez or anything. I, I just won't trust my daughter to go by herself. All along the border, there are reminders like this jacket that for some, the impulse to cross this fence or a future wall may be too strong to stop. I'm leaving El Paso and driving 500 kilometers west to the twin towns of Nogales. The first fence went up here in the 90s, splitting the town in half. The cartels who control the drug trade and the people smuggling responded by going underground, and they have turned this area into the tunnel capital of the border. I'm joining a patrol of the water tunnels connecting Mexico and the United States. We don't know who we might run into, so the police go ahead of us. We don't know what to expect. Precaution is needed. So what, what just happened? ¿Qué, qué pasó recién? Smugglers and migrants use the cover of darkness and wait for the right moment to head towards the US end of the tunnel. So the policeman just told me that after they turned on the flashlight, they saw someone and this person ran away. Minutes later, we catch a glimpse of him in the distance. He's not moving. And Sergio is point, pointing at this person with, with a flashlight. Sergio believes it's better to back up and alert the police, so we are heading towards the entrance of the tunnel. The traffickers used not only the subterranean infrastructure, the authorities have found more than 110 tunnels built by Mexican cartels. They call them narco tunnels. In this cemetery, one of them hides in plain sight. This is the entrance of a tunnel which was recently filled in. They used to carry drugs to the other side of the border. And as you can see, the fence is just about 100 meters from here. On the American side, Tony Estrada has been a sheriff for 25 years. He isn't sure the wall President Trump wants to build will be effective. They're very creative. If you do anything, they'll go under it, they'll go over it, and they'll go around it. So it's a phenomenon that's not going to stop. No wall, no matter how beautiful and how big or how expensive, is going to stop people that are desperate, people that are needy, and people that are poor. Arrests of undocumented immigrants in the U.S. have increased by nearly 40 percent since President Trump's crackdown. But Estrada believes this is missing the point. Illegal immigration, as far as I'm concerned, pales, pales compared to the drug problem. When you're spending all your resources 
on illegal migration, and, and you're talking about relocating, identifying people that are living in the community that have families and are contributing, it's useless. It's, it's not putting your resources to the best. Criminal aliens, I've said it for years. Yes, go after them. Let's get out of the criminal aliens, but don't bother anybody else. This shelter in Nogales opened three decades ago. Since then, it has received hundreds of thousands of migrants. We find hope and faith, but also sadness and pain. For the last 13 years, Eusebia Ortiz has lived in Florida working in tomato fields. She was picked up trying to get back into the U.S. after visiting family in Mexico. Nos salió la migración y yo tuve que correr, pero mis pies no me ayudaron y me caí. Fue que me, me hizo un desguince en mi pie. Despite the risky journey, she's already planning to go back. Si Dios quiere, llegamos a Estados Unidos, que yo tengo la fe que vamos a llegar otra vez. If anyone is able to judge the success of a wall, it is perhaps the people smugglers. This one says it has reduced numbers. He was happy to appear on camera but preferred not to be named. No, oh, así funciona, y bastante funciona, ¿me entiendes? O sea, se ha bajado mucho, ¿me entiendes? De, de la... Lo, de indocumentados por la cuestión del muro. For him, a bigger wall could mean fewer clients, but more money. Pues va a subir, se me hace que el doble de lo que se cobraban, 6, 7, van a cobrar hasta 12, 14, ¿me entiendes? Va, va a subir muchísimo, pues, ¿me entiendes? Y mucha gente va, va a subir elevando, pues. Y siempre va a, seguir, va a haber gente que lo va a pagar. Nogales may be another example of the mixed and complex nature of border towns and of the unintended consequences of building barriers. A wall will stop some people, but others will find a different way round. My final destination on this road trip is Tijuana. And no other place on the US-Mexico frontier has a more intimate relationship with the wall than this city. Here, the US government started building the border's first barrier almost three decades ago. It has shaped the lives, identities and fates of millions. Alonso Delgadillo, known as El Norteño, is a graffiti artist who has lived here for 25 years. The wall for him became a campus an opportunity to express his feelings towards life in a place divided. Para mí lo importante siempre es el tema de cómo afecta la situación política y social en la comunidad. El tema de la familia y las personas es algo que siempre me ha interesado desarrollar en mi obra. En la imagen trato de plasmar una familia de golondrinas que a pesar de que su condición natural es migrar y moverse de un lugar a otro, están situados en un lugar con las alas eh, sujetadas, como si estuvieran siendo eh, prisioneros o secuestrados de alguna manera, ¿no? ¿Por qué esa mano así tan grande que...? His art is born of the desire to show how the barriers affect people and his own family too. Yo recientemente fui, soy padre, pues tengo un hijo de tres meses. Entonces yo veo a mi, a mi esposa cargando a nuestro hijo y mi esposa trabaja en San Diego, yo trabajo en Tijuana y también soy parte de esa prisión fronteriza que puedo reconocer desde mi imaginación, pues ¿no? en el día a día yo vivo una especie de prisión aquí, pues no, estamos separados, pues eh, y la criatura, nuestro hijo, pues es como esa golondrina, o sea, él va y viene, pues no, o sea, él no tiene un lugar ahorita, pues no, su lugar es la frontera, pero no es ni Tijuana ni San Diego. Painting on these bricks is a cathartic experience, but he wishes it wasn't there at all. A veces tenemos más problema con la con la policía de Estados Unidos por pintar el muro del lado mexicano que con los mismos policías mexicanos, pues. ¿no? Deberían de estar en ambos lados y en realidad lo que yo siempre digo no debería de estar. O sea, es un muro no debería de estar. Es como galería es buena, pero no es una galería. O sea, es. No es, no es the most frequently cross-border in the world unites two countries 
and there is no indifference to the divisions that engenders. The barriers became a symbol and not a solution to complex problems. El muro es el enemigo. Es como más allá del muro no se puede estar pues para mucha gente. La mayoría de la población eh, ve Estados ve Estados Unidos a través del muro. Yo crecí viendo a las familias pasar un domingo por hoyitos entre el muro y tocarse los dedos a través del muro, o sea, eso para mí siempre me ha marcado, o sea, y te digo, es una situación que se ha normalizado, porque todos los días frecuento el muro, transito por el muro, las carreteras principales de las ciudades nos recuerdan todos los días, en todos los horarios, que, te, que tenemos un muro que nos divide, pues, ¿no? Yo entiendo el sentimiento que estamos pidiendo Cuando según sin documentos uno no tiene derechos Sigamos la verdad de nuestro lado La tenemos, ya sabemos que las acciones ilegales son las de ellos Olmeca is another whose art is defined by the wall He's a hip hop artist living in the US But has family on both sides of the border and, You know, Nina Simone said it best You know, that as artists we, we have to reflect our reality Having crossed the border so many times growing up, it definitely resonated with my, my understanding of, of restrictions and placing borders on people. Um, so in the same way, and I took that on to my music. I attached that to my music. So it's like, if I don't agree that there's a border that needs to be crossed in order for people to live in a particular place, I wouldn't, I made the effort not to put borders and restrictions on my music. There are an estimated 11 million undocumented immigrants living in the U.S. Olmeca has relatives among them, and Trump's rhetoric against these people has left him dreading the prospect of his family breaking up. I had a family member that had to go into a government building, and from the moment that we got the scheduled date to the actual date, there is a lot of tension, there's a lot of arguments at home. Because why? Because of the fear. There's a very real fear that anything could happen to our families at any given moment. Olmeca sees it as an artistic duty to continue highlighting what he sees as controversial issues. This very abnormal behavior um, and relationships between government agencies, federal agencies, and local enforcement That's something that's abnormal. It's not normal. I feel like that's all we, that's all we can do is, is challenge. I feel music needs to be an act of, of expression that is thought provoking. And I don't, I don't agree that you can make music without reflecting your reality. If deported, his relative may end up here in Tijuana. The city receives more deportees than any other along the border. For the deported, it's a painful contradiction. They feel like foreigners in the country they were born in. That's my hood, and you know we always try to represent as much as possible. So that 530 is just the area code. That's where I'm from. Chris's tattoos tell the story of a rough life. As a youngster, he got involved in gangs, guns, and drugs, spending his teenage years in jail in the U.S. But he was deported to Mexico because he was born there. He was dropped into a place he barely knew having to speak a language he had already forgotten. I think about what I want to say in English and then I have to translate it in my mind to be able to say it. And um, some words I can't even pronounce in Spanish, so, you know, it's, that, that's really the main, the reason why call centers have worked out for me. This is a call center in Tijuana in northern Mexico, and many of the people working here have been deported from the U.S. Hello, Sharon, this is Chris. The purpose for my call is to inform you that your manufacturer warranty has expired on your 2012 Chevy Equinox. It might be surprising to people in the States to know they are talking to tattooed ex-gang members. And surely rival gangs in the same workplace is a recipe for disaster. You'll have maybe some uh, Southerners. Uh, those are uh, Uh, Sureños, they, you, they yeah. represent like the number 13, usually they're from the south, that's why they're southerners. And then you have uh, a group of people like, uh, like us and my, some of my friends who are northerners and who are, we identify ourselves with the number 14. In the States, we, we can't stand seeing each other and we can't, 
for the most part, there's not even there's not even talking civil or nothing like that. It's just you know we see each other and it's just it's bad business and we just go at it. Uh, no questions asked. Here, you know, we we keep it respectful and you know and, and make it work for the for the sake of workplace and, and, and trying to live a, a peaceful life. This gentleman right here uh, on the row where I'm sitting at, um, he has a couple of tattoos on, on his arm and, and face. Chris is a supervisor here and doesn't even think of going back to his old life. But the new one hasn't been easy. Sometimes people don't even give you that, that, that opportunity. They see you and they're like, ha, doesn't know any better. Some stupid little gangster or wannabe or, you know, stupid druggie or an addict or deportee, you know, whatever, however they want to date with you, but that's, what, that's how they, they look down on you. Tijuana may be a few miles from the States, but it's a different world. Believe me, because I've done it back home. Um, you just can't go anywhere here and just start selling drugs you know, just to get by or make money or hustle or whatever. It doesn't work like that. You need some type of permission out here from somebody and uh, who that is, God knows. But, you know, uh, if you don't have that permission, you can pretty much count on you being found dead somewhere. I've traveled across town to an evangelical church housing Haitian migrants. It's a place to worship, but it is also a shelter and a place of limbo. Thousands of them are stranded. They fled the country after the 2010 earthquake, but are now unable to enter the US due to an Obama policy aimed at dissuading more Haitians from arriving. Me da miedo, pero una cosa que yo sepa, yo no voy a contar entre las personas que van a ser deportadas. ¿Por qué? Yo no me voy a ir. Christopher and his countrymen are the latest example of the stories that for decades have been part of this town. Me voy a que prefiero quedarme como acabé de decir. Prefiero quedarme aquí mismo enfre enfrentando todas las dificultades, pero deportado. Porque yo sé cómo están la, las cosas allá en mi país. No es nada buena. Tijuana is a place of aspirations, of broken dreams, of new beginnings. It's a city where people have learned to navigate being so close to the US and yet so far. So that's it, the end of my road trip. It has been a fascinating journey along a part of the world that belongs to Mexico and the US and in a way to neither. This is a land of paradox, a land of extremes. It can be cruel, violent and imposing and at the same time beautiful, gentle and gracious. It is a place where people have learned to live in a strange intimacy with a wall and probably many more will have to do the same. On this trip, I have seen the challenges of building more barriers, talk to people happy with a wall in the backyard, and to those that believe that more fences won't stop migrants, no drugs. This border is, after all, home to millions of people that, no matter what you think of the wall, now face a dramatic, momentous, and divisive time. <laughs>